Hello and welcome to Alchemy 101, the show that explores all avenues of transformation and aims to offer some useful nuggets that can support us in living in line with nature in a way that's true to our nature. No matter how contrary that might seem, just like this nightingale, the bird that sings out in the dark. I'm JJ, the Practical Alchemist, and I'm so glad that you could join me today as we meet someone who has spent her life testing her limits in every area of life and thriving on it. I almost don't know where to start. But here we go. Rhonda Vettiri is known as one of the most powerful women in technology with a mission to empower and inspire others. She's a global C-suite executive whose CV or resume is littered with household names and she's also an athlete who applies a mental model in and out of the office that guides how she leads her life with others around her. Rhonda is an active leader whether she's spearheading corporate initiatives around the world, competing in another Ironman 70.3 mile triathlon or mentoring students and athletes. Her most recent book is called Grit and Grind, 10 Principles for Living an Extraordinary Life. Well, Rhonda certainly does that. I don't know about you, but I'm breathless at what this woman has achieved and also curious as to how she does it. Here's how we started our conversation. Oh, my word. Um, Rhonda, of all the people I ever meet, you're one of the few who I could really seriously call a high flyer. I mean, you have done so much in your life, not only in the corporate world, but also also in your private life. I mean, you know, the, the your athletic achievements, shall we put it that way. How have you been able to, A, get that far, and B, sustain all of that. Um, and then, of course, we know the answer is in your book, Grit and Grind, which we'll talk about in a bit. But tell me a little bit more about yourself first. Oh, JJ, it's an honor to be here with UK Health Radio. A little bit about myself. I have an Italian background. My family's from Calabria. Uh, I have worked since I was 12 years old. Didn't have an option, JJ. Wow. Wow. So I think that I know my childhood, my mom pushing me to work, nothing came easy, has continued within my life. I grew up in swimming sports. So you mentioned my athletic uh, capabilities. I've always been into every sport, JJ, when I was young. My mom made sure I had the discipline and then also worked since I was 12. So I've carried that into my life, the sports aspect because of the mentality, yeah. the teamwork, the health and wellness. And that's helped me sustain and grow in my career. And I talk a lot about the mental fortitude with sports within the business world. So I fell into technology, but right. health has always been in my background. And I've been a big proponent of that, JJ, my entire life. Yeah. I noticed one of the companies that you had a senior position in is a, a very well-known nutrition company, uh, which I mentioned. I'll mention the name of right now, but I, I noticed that because that's very much um, where I'm coming from as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, I often wonder the people who do get to the, the sort of level that you've got to in corporate life or in business life or even in sporting life, I do often wonder whether it really is a lot of it down to what was instilled into you as a child. And it sounds like that was the case with you. Yes. I reflect back on it now, JJ, at the time when I was younger, I didn't realize it, but now everything comes back to your childhood. And I would, yeah. and I, if you think about it, you have that moment, it intersects in your life. You make a decision, good or bad, moral compass even, and what my values were instilled in me, I, it came from my childhood and my upbringing and my friends around me. Right. Yeah, that's very important. It's, it's your community, isn't it? Which is very important as well. If you have that supportive community, then you can almost achieve anything, which you kind of have. <laughs> Because you've done, you've done very, very well in your life. Um, so let's talk then about the book. What made you write the book? Grit and grind. Well, what yeah. made me write 
the book, a lot of my, I would say, peers, male peers kept tapping me on the shoulder. That's my second book. My first one was a dummies book about technology. Right. Let's not beat ourselves, those yellow and black books. Yeah. And this, this one, a lot of executives kept saying, when's your next book? And I was, I was like, oh, oh, do I really want to do this? And then I committed to it, JJ, but I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want the pressure of that deadline right. um, on on myself because of work that has enough pressure on it and everything else in life. But I committed to it and it took me several years to put mm-hmm. pen to paper. And that was hard. I did it on airplanes, flying around the world <laughs> um, for work. And I kept it very confidential. And I'm happy I did. I'm happy everyone kept, the universe taps you and I kept getting it. Yeah. When is your next book? And then I finally paid attention and said, all right, Rhonda, commit, do it. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. And I think a lot of people do get put off, especially if they're very busy, get put in, they, they put off writing something that they know will be of value to others. But it's just like, oh, you know, I don't want to get under, I don't have that pressure. I don't want to have the deadline. And how many times have we seen depictions of authors, you know, having writer's block because they're facing this deadline and their publishers ringing them saying, where's the manuscript? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's half finished. And no, it hasn't even been started, right? You got all of that. Going on. So, you know, clever, clever ploy there. And uh, it's called Grit and Grind, as you say, and I love the cover of it because uh, you're not afraid to get your hands dirty, literally, because the cover shows you with dirty, dirty hands uh, and a dirty face um uh, and say you know are you ready to get your hands dirty and and achieve what you want to achieve i mean is that something that is really important that analogy of getting your hands dirty yes and you have to be in the details or you cannot manage so many executives do not dive down deep and understand what is happening i'm not a surface manager jj and you can't help your team or lead if you don't have the context the metrics and understand. So I've seen it across multiple companies and I love taking time to understand. And that cover is, and that's, that's real dirt fertilizer. Right. And I didn't want that picture on the cover, JJ. That's a whole story with myself. (laughs) No, (laughs) but it depicts, I didn't know how else to say it and show that you need to understand and get into the details And life is not being on the surface. You got to dive down deep into understanding yourself, understanding others, companies. And then that way you can understand where you're trying to go or at least make that North Star. So, yes, that cover was very, very um, enlightening. I had another cover picked out, just rocks and and what's at the bottom of the book. And we changed it. The publisher said, no, Ron, you should have this. And I'm like, okay. Well, it is an eye-catching cover and, and literally digging through the dirt to get to the gold. Hello, this is Alchemy 101, this show. <laughs> we like to dig for gold and find those nuggets. So, yeah, so you're offering up this 10-point plan or mm-hmm. you know, whatever you, however you want to program or however you want to describe it. So tell us a little bit about that. What are the insights that you got from digging deep? into how you can achieve what you want to achieve? Yes, um, the 10 principles. I'll take uh, people. Chapter three, her name is Lori. She was not in a right job fit. And I found her from a skip level. Understanding and going seven layers down in an organization and actually having the discussions with everyone for 21 minutes. Do you like what you're doing? Are you happy? What are your skills? What makes you tick? And moved her into a role that she since blossomed and we still keep in touch because she wasn't utilizing JJ, her creative side. And I'm all right. about science, technology, engineering, and math. And she was a composer and was a drummer and a trumpet player. And we, I'm just finding her, moved her into a different role. And now she's a, a, a vi- vice president and doing great in life. How fantastic. So what was the, what was the key there? I mean, how did, you identify that she needed to move into a different role, presumably where she could express this creative side of her, but presumably she's not playing drums at work, right? She's not, but I did have her come to team outings and open up and have drums. And people were like, 
we didn't know this about her. She's creative. And that gave her confidence. I wanted her to work on her confidence too. She's an artist and moved her into a creative role because I had a discussion with her and I dug deep into what does she want? Yeah. And that's, that was how we were able to move her and she accepted it. And she's, she's so happy to this day, JJ, if you spoke to her now, she would say we changed her life. Right. And so what was the, so what I'm trying to get at here then is what was the difference? So what was stifling her or creating a, an issue with her in that previous role? And, you know, what was the, what was the change? What was the tweak that m- allowed her to express herself? Mm. She wasn't, her man, her manager wasn't listening. They weren't having those conversations. Uh, yeah. It's amazing what a conversation will do mm-hmm. and pausing and taking the time And it was just like a hamster wheel. Let's come in and do the task. So moved her into a strategy, creative role. Ah, And then she blossomed instead of the day-to-day tactical, but she wasn't being heard. Right, right. But it's often difficult for people, isn't it? If you're in a a role in a company where you're not being heard, it's it can be difficult to switch and find a role where you will be heard. So how, you know... Have you got any advice or any thoughts for people who might be in that? Because a lot of people will be listening to this. Oh, I know that situation very well, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestions as to how you can tackle that issue? Yes. And and living and working in the UK in global environments and understanding the labor laws and work councils anywhere in the world, that's key. My challenge to everyone listening is have that conversation with your manager. They should welcome it. Not just at your mid-year review or annual review, your one-on-one, just say, where am I going in my career? What makes you happy to your manager? They won't be expecting it. Let's talk about what your goal, my goals are and Mm. how are you going to help me get there? So have that conversation, not just, oh, are you doing well? Yes, no but strategically plan. And if your manager hasn't thought about that, that's an indication to yourself. Right. Yes. And so you can, you can take things from there. I understand. Yeah. And so what else um, then in grit and grind um, do you suggest for people to achieve what they want to achieve? Get out of your comfort zone, take the hard assignments, get a mentor outside of your industry to challenge you in that you look up to, I see so many people go, I'm in this field. I want to mentor in the same field, get someone out of the field and learn from. That's interesting. So what is the reason for that? Is it because people are too close to you if they're in the same field? Is that the issue? It doesn't challenge your mind and broaden it enough because you become so siloed into one, what I call vertical, a couple topics. You need to open your mind, like traveling opens your mind and have a different leadership style as well in a different industry. Yeah. So it really is about a a lot of courage as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Managerial courage. Yeah. So, (laughs) and courage and fear, uh, people get very confused when we start talking about courage and fear. And (laughs) so what are your thoughts about that? Courage and fear. Well, fear, why? I always ask myself why, but I'm one to, that tends to run into problems and solve them, not run away. Mm. Um, that's my personality. That's why you see me move around the companies and I just want to help and turn around things and high performance teams. Your fear because you care, you think you're going to fail. Yeah. Uh, everyone has that. If they don't say that, They're not telling the truth, JJ, but embrace that. I know it's hard. Embrace it. I embrace it at Ironman races, 70.3s. We all have those butterflies. We all have them. Yeah. And you challenge yourself. You know, you're challenging yourself when you feel it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what courage is, isn't it? It's just like knowing that there is fear there, but just going and doing it anyway. Um, Feel the fear and do it anyway, as somebody once famously said. Yeah. So, and it's the same whether you're doing an Ironman challenge uh, or whether you're working in a company or in your own business, I guess. I think a lot of people silo things as well. So anything outside of work is very different. So, you know, you might be able to achieve this at work, but then 
people don't apply it elsewhere, but it's something which runs all the way through life, isn't it? It does. And that's why very, it's important to know what makes you tick for active meditation and discipline. And that's why the sports aspect, JJ, from a health aspect, it keeps me sharp. I pivot, create strategic thinking, and I bring that into the workplace. So my whole life is a, I, I believe in it, I'm doing it. And folks at work see it as well. And it's important that you have that continuous flow because it helps you. It really does help you in all aspects of your life, the discipline and the goals. Yeah. And so then I'm thinking if somebody has not had the start in life that you had, where you were instilled with this discipline, where you yeah. were um, shown how, you know, working brings results or, you know, how to get on in life, let's say. So let's say there is somebody listening to some, many people probably listening to this and they're saying, yeah, but I didn't have that. And I don't really know quite how to go about that. Is there any one thing that people can do just to really kind of kickstart this approach to their life? Because it's, I, you know, I see people everywhere who kind of fall back into this kind of, oh, yeah, but notion, right? How do you mm-hmm. get past the, oh, yeah, but? I would say, here's a little tidbit. Start your alarm clock 15 minutes early. Get up. Don't look at your phone. Challenge yourself that way. That will be hard. Let's face it. Yeah. And do something stretching or walking. I encourage stretching and set yourself for the day, your intentions. That will help you gain confidence and write down a goal even more. And it takes an average, you know, 30 to 45 days to get into a routine, JJ. Mm. Yeah. And then start stacking upon that foundation. You have to start with something small, not just a big bang approach because people get overwhelmed and they won't sustain it. Right. Yes. And it's that overwhelm, I think, that really gets to most people. So it really is these bite sized chunks to get you into the into the rhythm. And so it brings me on to another question I have for you, this rhythm. So you are doing all this work in the corporate world, but you're also doing Ironman challenges. How do you manage that? How do you manage your your life, your time in order for you to do these things? Yes, I talk about in the book, time is currency. So I look at my life in a year, chunks at a time, plan the races, the triathlons, the 70.3s, the endurance racing. We raced across America last year, 3,070 miles on a bike. Oh, wow. Um, A push bike. Yeah. Pedaling across America. Yes. Yes. Wow. That was last year. That was a big That was seven days, eight hours and 55 minutes uh, to complete that from California to Annapolis, Maryland. But I look at it in chunks of time and month by month, plan out the racing, the board meetings you have a year in advance, usually the racing you can plan a year in advance. And then I work backwards with the, obviously the work schedule. Yeah. If I don't have a race, JJ, I don't continue my flow. So that's myself holding myself accountable, but I plan my life out like that. My girlfriends know I'm going to throw a party a year in advance. They have the date a year in advance. Oh my God. (laughs) Everything is planned out. Now, some folks might say, oh my gosh, that's overwhelming. It takes time. Yeah. But if you don't write it down and commit to yourself, it won't happen. So that's one of her secrets, such powerful focus. Right now though, we have to take a very short break. Back right after this, from our station sponsors. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. And you're listening to Alchemy 101 here on UK Health Radio with me, JJ, the practical alchemist, and my guest, the powerhouse that is Rhonda Viteri. Before the break, Rhonda was talking about how she writes everything down, and I wanted to clarify whether that means putting pen to actual paper. Yes, even though I'm in technology, I have a calendar that has pen to paper, and that helps me mentally write it down, and that's my 
accountability to myself going, oh, I've inked it. It's not just typing in a phone. It's a different, it, it really is a mental um, goal. And I feel like I own it more when I write it down. That's just my personality. I don't, that's just pen to paper. Well, I mean, you say it's just your personality, but I know for myself that if I, if, if I don't write something down, I very easily forget it and it doesn't sink in. I have to physically with a, a pen or a pencil, write something. And yes. I've even started, um, yeah, exactly. You're holding up a pen. I've even started keeping a physical diary calendar as, a, as well as my online calendar. Same. So I, two reasons for that one so that I don't lose everything if something awful happens online secondly that I actually have things written down so I really do remember them more you know and you know you don't know what's going to happen in life you could lose your you know lose all your access to your technology and then where would you be but I find that writing things down really helps and it helps me organize my brain or organize Mm. myself so that I, and somehow, I don't know if you feel this, you you probably, I won't second guess, but I somehow feel more secure or confident because things are written down. Do you find Agreed. that? I do. I, I have both as well, but writing it down, it, it and you could take, I take it on the plane with me as well. And I look, I like to look at things long-term mm. um, and off my device for your eyes as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, uh, the diary I have for this year, it has one of those lovely planners that you can actually see the whole year in, in one go. Now I'm not as organized as you, so I haven't really kind of engaged with that yet, but it's there. Should I want to do that? And sometimes I do think to myself, well, maybe I should just sort of plan things out a little bit more and then I might, you know, I might actually achieve a bit more. So yeah. And maybe I'll get your book and get more tips on how to do that. So. It is interesting, is it, that writing thing is very important and and that planning thing is very important. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, but, you know, I don't really hold with goals and all of that. Well, I I, and I understand that. But, um, you know, maybe you don't have to have set goals, but maybe maybe it's a good idea to just kind of know what you're working towards so that you Mm -hmm. can you can actually, you know, organize your time better. Right. I just put something out there and I call it reverse engineering in the book. Yeah. Declare it and then work backwards. That's fine. As long yeah. as you have incremental steps to where you want to go and not moving backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that reverse engineering is really, really very useful. Yeah. You're quite right. So, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to write this book. I want it to be published by. So, so what do I have to do when? in order for that to happen. Yeah. Or I would like to leave my job and, you know, go become self-employed by this point. So what do I need to do at what stage in order for that to happen? Because otherwise you can be sitting around saying, yeah, I want to go self-employed. And then you get to your, you know, the date that you've said and nothing's happened. You're still there. You're still working. You still, you still think, I want to be self-employed. Um, and, you know, not just for work either, in your personal life. I mean, you, you were saying, I, mean, I can't believe, planning parties a year ahead. I mean. Yes. And all the girl, my girlfriends that from two years old to sixth grade, there's a lot of them. I'm very loyal. Uh, again, coming back to the first point, community is important. Yeah. So there's about 30 women that know the first weekend in December, we just had it. It'll happen again. I've been doing it for over 13 years. It's a staple in their life. They know they're going to come to New York. We're all going to be in one room, JJ. We'll celebrate each other, our accomplishments for the year. I go around and talk about how grateful I am to all of them, what sticks out that they've done and, you know, for their goals. And really it's, I think it's important that we have that and continue that dialogue and it's a safe environment Yeah, that we can all celebrate each other and help each other through challenges in life. But a year, that's the year in advance planning. And they appreciate it. There's no excuse, JJ, if they don't show up because they know about it. Because <laughs> they've known about it for a year. Exactly. But what a beautiful thing to do to to spend some time in with your community 
together in one room and celebrate each other. Gratitude, is that an important part of your daily life as well? Daily life, I wake up and I send three gratitude messages a day out of the blue to folks that don't even know I'm grateful for them. And this year's gala was called the Girlfriend Gratitude Gala. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, it, and do you find, I find that um, a, a gratitude uh, practice is very helpful. I find it um, empowering, actually. So is that something that you would say as well, that it it does empower you? There's something about that gratitude element in your life that really sets you alight almost. It does. And it, it, all of everyone I'm reaching out to have brought me joy and I just want to give that light to others. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, people listening to this might say, yeah, but yeah, what's that got? To, how does that help me? How do, well, it does though, because it's that energy of of passing on that flame, if you like, of of light that really empowers you as well. So what a what a fantastic thing to do. And maybe you don't have to have a gala, a girlfriend's mm-hmm. gala, but you can maybe have a you know a get together with your friends and maybe people that you haven't seen for a long time can come together. And that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It's really empowering. Yeah. It's empowering and friends that we hadn't seen each other from COVID. And mm. I had girlfriends say, Rhonda, I didn't realize how much I needed this. I, the only thing I said to him, JJ, was show up with a dress, heels and a smile. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just grateful for all of you and just be on time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. And that's a great way to to issue a party invitation, you know, just turn up, turn up with your your, your frock, your dress and a pair of heels and uh, we'll all have a good time. So it seems to it sounds to me and, and, and talking to you now, I can see that you have a great deal of energy. And uh, this, see, this is the other thing that people seem to think that if you're very successful, you're going to be exhausted all the time. Mm. How do you, you know, this must be part of your strategy, if you like, for managing your energy as well. It is. Um, I know what I I love to give off and give back. You know, you have, there's givers and takers in life and I'm a, yeah. I'm a giver. So that's my energy. And that brings me more energy and fuels me to push through large meetings, long days at work. As long as I have a, no day is balance. Let's say that, but balance in my life. Here's the yeah. friendship category. Here's the family category. Here's the giving back. Here's the work. All of that feeds the energy wheel. JJ, thank you for pointing that out. Because if you're just doing one thing, you're going to get, it's not a good feeling. You need to, you don't feel like you're living your best life either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. People talk about work, like work life balance. I prefer just to say life balance because, you know, I, I tend not to make a distinction too much, but you do need to do different things. And then what other people have, have mentioned to me is the importance of rest and mm. recuperation. So is that something that you factor in as well? Yes, I wear this whoop band. I know people can't see it on the radio. Oh, yeah. But... I only learned about those recently. I'd never heard of one before. <laughs> I can see it on your wrist. Yeah. Technology, uh, uh, data. I'm a data person, as folks probably know by now, about med- yeah. managing yourself and businesses and outcomes. But rest is important. Sleep is a weapon. If you don't have the right sleep, and it's going to go haywire with, with different time zones working, but I measure it and I'm very diligent to it because you can't perform as an athlete without rest either or no. in and out of the workplace. Right, right. Yeah, especially as an athlete, you have to have that recuperation time, don't you? Otherwise, you just you just burn out. You can't you can't uh, perform. Yeah. And so the sleep. Yeah, very important. Um, that's, I think, becoming more and more widespread now that people understand the importance of sleep for many, many different reasons, but overall health, de- definitely. And then nutrition now, I uh, mentioned before that you uh, had a position with a well-known nutrition company. So is that also presumably something that you really take care of in your life? Yes, nutrition and sleep. It's hard when you're on the road. I do pack, I do bring my own. Well, if I'm on a long airplane flight, JJ, I, mm-hmm. I bring my own. I will not eat the airplane food. Nothing, well done. No you. offense to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, I, 
I'm getting even more better at plant-based diet. That was one of my goals for this right. year, even better. Um, but I am a protein. I know what I eat for my blood type. There's a book on that. Right. So I know what gives me energy for yeah. that in my health. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting you say that. I was just thinking about that the other day because somebody had mentioned um, how they do well on um, a vegan diet and uh and i thought yeah but i don't and i thought and i was thinking probably it's blood type right probably it is. is yeah so it is. it's knowing what's right for you listening to your body knowing what is good for you knowing what effect certain foods have on your body as well and uh, gut health yeah gut yeah health. gut health absolutely but um yeah the the whole idea of, of um you do so much traveling crossed my mind that it probably would be very difficult unless you did take your own food with you to sustain a really balanced diet because let's face it, not many airlines do really great food. And um, I I tend not to bother (laughs) unless I'm on a very long flight, in which case I'll take my own as well. Yeah. And then, you know, traveling, doing all the traveling that you do, I'm guessing that you also have a strategy for making sure that that doesn't impact you too much either. You, you're traveling between different time zones all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you manage things like jet lag and just being, you know, getting to a different? Yeah. So going to India long flight, I use these long flights for intermittent fasting too. Uh-huh. Okay. So right. that helps. And when I land, I'll have spaghetti bolognese. I'll say ahead of time, I don't want to offend anyone, but I know what makes me work. Oh, spaghetti yeah. bolognese. And I'll go to the gym and sweat out the jet lag. And then I'm back on track. Wow. Right. So you've worked out what works for you in those circumstances. Yeah. And don't apologize for saying spaghetti bolognese. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in India, in India, they're like, you don't want curry and rice. So I'm like, (laughs) I'm sorry to offend you, but this is, this is just the diet that I've known for years and what works. Otherwise I will crash my energy. Yeah. And it's what you were brought up with, presumably, that kind of thing. Although spaghetti bolognese, you know, the, the the spag bowl that we know here in the UK isn't quite the same, probably, as the one that you would have. <laughs> but it's the same kind of idea. Yeah. It's, it is one of our staples here in the UK, of course, spaghetti bolognese. So um, that and Indian curry. <laughs> which is also very good for you because of all the spices and the turmeric and everything else in it. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's great for people to work out what works for them. Not one size fits all. That doesn't ever work. You you know, nobody can tell anybody how you should live because you have to work that out for yourself in many areas like nutrition. None of this is the same. No. And I would encourage everyone when you, if you have a coach, I I don't anymore because I know it works for my body. And, and it's, unless you're living the life, it's hard for a coach to say you're going to Singapore, India, what you can't just sit here and have a normal uh, training and nutrition schedule. You have to do what works for you. And it takes discipline to follow your and feel your body too, on what you respond to it. That's important. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so I know what I do to listen to my body. Um, I've never asked anybody this before, but how do you tune into your body? I know what I do. I just sit quietly and just feel into my body and maybe silently ask a question, you know, is this good for me or should I, you know, I don't know. What what do you do? I swim. Yeah. I tune into my body then and my thoughts come to me. And I can, I feel every ounce of my body and my thoughts are crystal clear in the water and in tranquil environment. And maybe it's the sound of the water, but that's how I tune into myself. Fantastic. Now, do you swim in a pool, indoor pool, or do you swim in the sea? I swim in the sea. I've just actually had a swim just this afternoon. Yeah. In, great. In, in, yeah. Yeah. Virtually every day I go for a swim in the sea all year round. I don't wear a wetsuit, Right. This is the east coast of Scotland, but I don't wear a wetsuit. And I do find people who listen to the show will be sick to death of hearing me talking about this, but it does come up a lot. I I do find that it really helps in many, many other ways. But also, yes, you're right. There is that element of when you're in the water, 
everything goes really still and quiet and you can really unless the waves are really bashing you around, you can really tune into your body. So. <laughs> but I'm guessing you don't swim in the sea in New York? Oh, I swim in a, a, a pool, but in the Ironman 70.3s, we're in the sea, yeah. we're in lakes, and I love open water swim. I'm a scuba diver as well. But to train, it's in, it's an Olympic-sized pool here in the community. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Scuba diving. Now, there's a way of really just getting away from everything and just floating. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. What a great thing to do. Honestly, it, I, I, I love your energy and Thank I you. love the way that you've created this life for yourself. Um, which is obviously really giving you so much energy and so much passion. And the book, it just sounds like a, a brilliant way to energize other people. We're, we're coming, nearly coming to the end here. So they can, people can find out more about you at your website, can't they? But they can also buy the book. This, you've got a se- separate website for the book as well, haven't you? Yes. And on Amazon, they can, they can buy it off of Amazon as well. Yeah. So, and it's grit and grind. And uh, so I think the the website for the book is gritandgrindbook.com. And uh, and then you have your own website where people can find out more about you as well. Uh, Tell us about that. Sure. It's rondavitieri.com, V as in Victor, E-T-E-R-E.com. And there's a tab on there for author and I'll take you to the book website as well. Fantastic. yeah. And, and do you have any, um, any tips or any things on the website or is that much more a sort of a corporate website? I have a lot of tips on that website mm. exactly about how I give back the races and the 10 principles. So there's a tab for everyone, JJ. Fantastic. Fantastic. And before we do go, here's the thing that I'm really intrigued by. What is it like? to do any kind of Ironman challenge because I'm sitting here thinking, I don't think I could. And anyway, at my age, I don't think I should probably, but then that's being ageist. So who knows? Um, But, you know, I'm just thinking, what is it like to do that? Is it really grueling? It is grueling. The 70.3 miles is grueling, but you talk about the fear and going for it heads down pushing yourself helps you and you, you work a lot out. The swim is 1.2 miles, 56 mile bike. This is back to back. You don't stop. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Running 13.1. So you need to know your body. Yeah. You know your nutrition. You need to plan. Yeah. And it's all, it's all mental because you can do more than what your body thinks. It's all mental to push yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that just reminds me, I was listening earlier to um, a radio show with um, the comedian here, Eddie Izzard on it, who, has a habit of doing like mental things like, you know, 40 odd marathons in 51 days or something like that. And he just pushes himself and pushes. His, and it's extraordinary, actually, what the human body is capable of, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so growth you, mindset. I yeah. Live it. yeah. So you're, you're just living proof of that. And uh, how wonderful. So we need more people like you in the world who can uh, fly the flag for, for, high achieving, not even high achieving, but just, you know, the potential, just showing the potential of each and every one of us, because we all have it, don't we? We do, JJ. And that's why I've been on this mission in my life, working since 12, nothing's instant gratification, continue to push myself and don't get stagnant and take your health very seriously. Yeah. Absolutely. Take your health very seriously. That could be that could be a mantra for this for this station. <laughs> Absolutely. Take responsibility for your health, right? Yeah. Well, Rhonda, thank you so much for coming on my show today. I've absolutely loved speaking with you and hearing about how you live your life and um, what a wonderful place you're in. So thanks so much. Thank you for caring. Rhonda Vitiri there a true high flyer who can give us all a few tips on how to live a healthy, happy life and achieve great things. Time for another break now, though. I'll be back with more after these messages from our station's sponsors. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. Health Radio. 
Radio. The station that makes you feel good. And you're listening to Alchemy 101 on UK Health Radio and the UK Health Radio podcast with me, JJ, the Practical Alchemist. And now something a little different. I mention cold water swimming a lot, as you've already heard today, but I haven't really gone into it in any depth, if you'll excuse the pun. So I thought it might be a good time to go through some of the benefits and also the do's and don'ts if you want to start swimming in your local river, lake or your favourite seaside spot. And you'll notice a few sound effects for good measure in here. I've been swimming in the sea near me through two winters now, and I love it. I know a lot of people don't get that, but I really do. Yeah, even when the air temperature is literally freezing, I've swum while it's snowed, rained, been windy or sunny. The weather never stops me from enjoying the experience. So why do I do it? Well, I'm sure it makes me less susceptible to any bugs that fly around in winter, but it's also the feeling of well-being I get that takes me back into that cold water time and time again. I even miss it when I'm not doing it these days. I just love literally immersing myself in nature and I feel refreshed mentally, emotionally and spiritually after even the shortest swim. Seeing the marine wildlife, the whales, dolphins and seals, the seabirds, hearing those birds calling and the seals singing. I love that. It's just magical. It's also a great way of meeting people and forging new friendships. Where I am, the camaraderie amongst us cold water swimmers is wonderful. And groups of us meet regularly to take a dip or a duck, as we call it in Scotland. Well, that's all very well, I hear you say. What about the science? OK, here are some facts that researchers have found. For a start, cold water does have a positive effect on the immune system. It helps to boost our white blood cell count. And that's because we're forcing our bodies to deal with changing conditions and over time, our defences get better and better at kicking in and making sure that we deal with all those nasties. Now, you'll hear people talking about the rush they get after a cold water swim. And that's because it's an activity that releases endorphins, those feel-good hormones. Cold water swimming challenges and stresses our bodies. And that brings out the endorphins to help us cope. It's also a form of exercise, so that can help with depression. And I really can vouch for the fact that if I'm at all low or grumpy, a swim literally washes all of that away. Honestly, it really does. Another thing it does is improve circulation and repeated exposure adapts us to the cold. So I must have adapted pretty well because a friend commented recently that I always behave as if I've just stepped out of a warm bath when I get out of the water these days. And I have to admit that my tolerance to cold generally has increased enormously. Now, you'll all be familiar with the idea of throwing a bucket of cold water over someone to cool their sexual urges. But a cold water dip actually has the opposite effect. It boosts oestrogen and testosterone production, so it increases fertility and libido, which in turn actually can lead to more confidence, higher self-esteem and a better mood. It's also been proven to burn more calories than you would swimming in warmer conditions because the body has to work that much harder to keep everything warm. And lots of studies have shown a link between cold water and stress reduction. Cold water swimmers become calmer and more relaxed, I promise you. I can definitely testify to that. A lot of women going through menopause say it helps them. And there are lots of studies going on right now to see whether there is a quantifiable correlation. And one of my local swimming groups definitely gives it the thumbs up. They call themselves the menopausal mermaids. So all in all, it's a great habit to get into. But as with any activity, always make sure you're safe. So here are some do's and don'ts. Don't start in the middle of winter. 
Start when the weather's warmer and allow your body to acclimatize. Keep swimming as the temperature drops and then your body will get used to the cold. That's how I've managed to swim through two winters now, or nearly two winters. We haven't quite finished this one. Only ever swim where it's safe. And make sure that you can get in and out of the water quickly and easily. Also, never swim on your own, especially when you're still acclimatizing to cold water swimming. Accidents can happen really easily and you don't want to risk hypothermia. In other words, if you fall over and hurt yourself and can't move very well, there's a high risk that you'll become hypothermic before help gets to you. Now, what to wear. Here's the thorny subject. <laughs> I always say we're not at a fashion show. Whatever keeps you warm and comfortable is the order of the day. Wear a swimming hat, either a woolly hat or a thermal swimming cap, and that'll keep you warm. Stop the heat loss through your head. Your extremities get cold first in the water, so neoprene gloves and booties or beach shoes are a must, I think, especially in the colder months. You can wear a wetsuit if you prefer. I don't. I just don't like the hassle of getting it on and off. And I also feel that by the time you've got your wetsuit off, you get colder. Whereas if you're just wearing a swimsuit, you can whip that off quickly and get something warm and dry on. Now then, do make sure that you have warm and dry clothes to change into afterwards. Have a hot drink standing by to help warm up your core and don't jump into a hot shower immediately. It's best to warm up gently. Getting into the water can be challenging, especially at first. Don't dive or jump in unless you're used to it. I never do, even now. Cold water shock is a real thing and it can be extremely dangerous. So I prefer to ease myself in gently, even as probably by now a fairly seasoned cold water swimmer. It just makes more sense to me. Let go of any need to prove how brave you are. Just a couple of minutes can be good enough in winter especially. A general rule is to spend one minute in the water for every degree of water temperature, but you need to listen to your body. And some say the positive effect of cold water tails off after five minutes anyway. So really there's no point in setting out to prove that you can stay in longer than the rest of us. No, it doesn't really work that way. So there you go. Cold water swimming really is for anyone. I love the sense of community, the all welcome attitude. You don't have to be super fit or have a model figure, far from it. Nobody cares about any of that in my experience. So why don't you, if you're interested, find out where people swim locally to you and give it a go? Because it really is more fun than you can imagine. Just stay safe. That is the main thing. And if you do want to find out more, because there is a lot more to find out, believe you me, all you have to do is Google cold water swimming or outdoor swimming, and you'll find websites like that of the Outdoor Swimming Society, which is outdoorswimmingsociety.com, or there's another one, swimsecure.co.uk. There's plenty of them around. And you'll also find Facebook groups as well, dedicated to cold water swimming. So check those out as well. And these are websites that will tell you the safe places to swim, where groups regularly swim. And you can join those groups online and find out what times people are going into the water so that you can go safely in a group. It's much more fun anyway than trying to go it alone. So enjoy. Start this summer if you haven't already started and see whether you get hooked on cold water swimming just like me. And with that, we've come to the end of the show. I hope you'll join me here on Alchemy 101 and UK Health Radio again for more inspirational guests. If you're listening to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform and you like what you hear, I'd love it if you could subscribe and share this episode. And it would be amazing if you could leave a review too. Remember, we also have a sister publication, Health Triangle magazine, so do check that out too. You'll find it at ukhealthradio.com. I look forward to being with you again, but for now, it's goodbye from me and that nightingale.